Hey, hey, welcome to Advancing AI, where we talk all things AI and machine learning. Now, what if I told you there is a way to tackle massive data sets that you simply would struggle to fit on your computer's memory? I mean, we're talking data so huge that you're constantly going to run into out-of-memory errors. Well, stick around today because we're going to be diving into just how you do that, leveraging Spark on Databricks. Now we'll have Sappy and Stuart from Databricks talking to us about it and showing us a demo in terms of how you can actually pre-process large data sets, even train machine learning models on data sets that would normally be way out of reach. This is game-changing stuff you won't want to miss. Now remember, if you like to see more videos like this, don't forget to like and subscribe. So stay tuned. Well, hello, Stuart, and hello, Sappy. How are you guys doing today? Yeah, good, thanks. Hi, Gabby. Hey, Gary. Oh, it's nice to have you both back on the platform. And today we've got an exciting session. We're going to be talking all about Spark and how that really applies to machine learning workflows and data science workflows. Uh, Stuart, introduce yourself first time First time here. So go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. So I'm another one of, of SEPI's colleagues. Um, I'm what's called a specialist solutions architect at Databricks. Um, so I help customers deploy their data science and machine learning workloads onto the platform. Um, and my, I guess I've been at Databricks for five years. Before that, my background was in consulting and um, doing delivery of, of data science projects in industry. Nice. Well, we know who you are, Sappy. So I, I I write a blog, really, really interesting mm -hmm. blog, by the way. And I've got a, I've got a question, Stuart. Um, what is Spark, and why okay. is it important in machine learning and data science workflows? Yeah, sure. We can start at the beginning and assume. People don't know. So Spark is a it's a framework for distributed computing. It's an engine for performing uh, distributed computations. So what does that mean? Um, practically, it's able to split up some task into a set of subtasks that can be executed by a number of workers, where each of those workers holds some like partition of the in input data set in memory. Um, and so that makes it very easy to scale out to much larger sets of data. Uh, and it made Spark very, very popular with data engineers because uh, they can parallelize the process of reading, transforming, and aggregating their data, and then writing it into um, into formats like Delta Lake. Um, so it comes with a kind of choice of language bindings, Scala, the original, because the whole thing's written in Scala, Python, R, and SQL, which is probably by far the, the largest uh, by usage on our platform. People are really, really keen on writing SQL against data that's in Databricks. Um, and it also comes with a number of APIs for working with data that's arriving in a streaming fashion too. Uh, again, kind of like cementing its, its applicability in the data engineering realm. So for, for data scientists, there is a, a kind of a room in the Spark house, which is uh, all filled with algorithms for distributed training and model inference. It's a fairly limited selection yeah. of algorithms that live inside MLlib in Spark, um, yeah. but they're very they're very powerful and they're um, things like the recommender algorithm that's in there gets a lot of use. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I've got another question, Stuart. Um, would you mind just going into what kind of data science projects or tasks typically would benefit from Spark? Yeah. Okay. I mean, this was this was really the motivation for writing the article, um, and a lot of the conversations that Sepi and I have with data science teams that are our customers uh, revolve around, okay, how best can I use Spark in my in my workflows? Um, and the subtext of a lot of those is really, do I really have to learn Spark in order to, to use Databricks? Uh, and so our answer is usually, no, that's absolutely not true. You can take your existing workflow, let's say you have some uh, single node type workflow where you're training and evaluating models on your, your local development environment, you can take that and you can lift and shift it into Databricks. You just run it on a single node cluster inside Databricks, and then you, you know you get the benefits of being able to access uh, data that's provided through the lake house. Um, yeah, so there's there are some kind of key things that you get if you are willing to experiment with using Spark in your in your workflows. That's a great point, Stuart. When I was a scientist back in the data scientist back in the day. Uh, when somebody said the word spark, I would go and hide. <laughs> it was it was super scary for me to start learning an entirely new language, all these complicated concepts about 
I don't know, partitioning your data and optimizing Spark jobs and so on. I had no clue, right? And uh, I think uh, mm. this article is uh, giving you um, another take on the whole Spark usage for data science jobs. Um, the, the great thing is that you don't really learn, need to learn Spark in order to take advantage of its functionality. There are different APIs that you can use similar to what you're already using as a data scientist, for example, Pandas API, or uh, there are specific types of tasks that you can use Spark for that makes your life easier without having to really learn Spark, if you know what I mean. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think I share the similar experiences with you, Sapi. Anyway, you've got something exciting for us today. So go ahead and uh, yeah, take it away, Stuart. Right, so yeah, as Sapi mentioned, actually there are APIs on, on top of Spark, which means if you're coming from a world of working with pandas for manipulating data, uh, then you don't really need to learn anything about Spark. You don't really have to understand what's happening under the hood since there's now like a, a specific pandas API on top of PySpark. Uh, so in the past, this was called Koalas, um, but it, and it was a kind of a separate project from, from PySpark. Um, but as of like version three or something, it got, it got rolled into the, the main PySpark code base. Um, so let me show you some of the things that this can do. Um, so by the way, this notebook uh, and, and a bunch of other useful demos are all available on our like DB demos website. Um, also known as the Databricks tutorial hub. Um, so we can put a link in the description. Um, so here, here are some examples. Uh, one around like reading data. So Pandas has a bunch of readers for different formats of data. PySpark Pandas has a lot of the equivalent uh, readers. So things like being able to read directly from, from JSON files. So this is using Spark under the hood to do that parallel read of the data. Um, but it's giving you back something that looks just like a, a Pandas data frame. Yeah, I think um, one great thing about this is that you can still run the same code, but then you don't have out of memory errors that you usually get with uh, pandas, with single node pandas that yeah. um, most data scientists use. Yeah. Is there, is there a limit in terms of you know, how big your data set could be before it ran out of memory? You know, just from experience. So could it be as large as possible? Theoretically, no, because if you have control over the way that data is partitioned, yeah. so uh, yeah, you can, yeah, you can you can process almost any size of of data set. Uh, yeah. You will need to kind of scale up the size of the cluster that you're using in order to do that. Yeah. Um, so here's here's another example, which is converting from a pandas data frame into a PySpark pandas data frame. Quite kind of common operation. So you could uh, you could inherit this pandas data frame from another part of a workflow. And then you want to do some Spark type operations on, on top of it, you can just use this from pandas method. So that's super easy. Um, so yeah, and you also have the ability to go the other way. So you can take a Spark data frame and turn it into a PySpark pandas data frame just by calling this pandas API method. And once you have this pandas uh, on PySpark data frame, you can treat it as though it's just a normal pandas data frame. So if you want to call Methods like value counts and sort values, that's uh, that's all there in the in the API. Um, and you can also do things like you can take your data frame and execute SQL directly on top of it. Um, so there's a, a lot of flexibility around the, the things that you can that you can do there. Yeah, so I mean that's that has kind of obvious applications when you I mean, okay, so for traditional machine learning workflows, you might never reach the point where you're feeling so much data into a training algorithm that you exceed the capacity of the of the nodes that you're training on. But you might have something upstream that's used to compute the features that go into that model, yeah. which is very large. So a good example of doing that is um, perhaps in a retail context, clickstream data from a, from a website. So you want to produce some set of behavioral metrics for all of your users based on their clickstream data. Yeah. Um, so obviously you're going to need the ability to work with potentially terabytes of, of data there. Uh, in order to produce the kind of this condensed set of information that then goes into the model. And that's why this kind of application is really helpful, both in terms of like being able to explore that data first and then being able to um, you know reliably produce those those features from those very large data sets. Yeah, and I guess uh, if you do that in the development cycle, then production cycle would be also much easier, right? Because you are basically you can replicate what you have been exploring with in production. Mm -hmm. Similar code. Yeah. So what we often see is there's a disconnect between 
the volume or the speed of data that's expected in production versus what you've, you've picked to train your model um, and evaluate it. And so when you go and deploy that model, either uh, you can't keep up with the, the speed that data is arriving or things are very slow to get results. Um, and that can happen in the in the kind of the feature engineering process, but it can also happen in the like in the model inference part. So um, we've got some kind of nice features that are part of ML flow that will allow you to perform like distributed model inference based on models that you train in your Python machine learning framework of choice. Um, so I've got another little example I can show you on that one. Yeah, what what type of use cases do you really see you know the benefit of Sparks coming out? You know, would it be for example segmentation or demand forecasting? You know, where where do you see the Spark um, being used on machine learning workflows or data science workflows? Sabi, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So the most common one that we see is. Uh, in demand forecasting for multiple products, yep. especially in uh, retail companies, sometimes they have thousands of products and they have to do parallel um, training, parallel hyperparameter optimization for all these different products. Yeah. And for that, they they do yeah. need a <laughs> distribution. Yeah. yeah, we found it really helpful, exactly what you were saying, where we had to do uh, demand forecasting across many, many different products, but not only for for one store, for each different units as well. So yeah, that, that was very, very helpful. Anyway, over to you, Stuart. I, I would say I've I've met this in uh, organizations who whose focus is, is kind of like, I would say, machine learning adjacent. So people who are doing kind of engineering simula simulation type work. Okay. Or in fact, also in, in kind of a consumer goods context um, for doing like pricing optimization. So yep. they they wanted to run some, and this is like an example that um, that we've put in the in the article. They wanted to run some optimization process across every one of their their markets, and I think there were some other dimensional kind of parameters in there. Um, and they just want to run the simulation over and over again on a relatively small data set, but it's a very compute intensive process. Um, yeah. so we've got like patterns that we can uh, give people for using Spark to to like distribute or parallelize that that process too. Yeah, that's um, a good one. Yeah, so this is the the example of of being able to use MLflow to do parallelized model inference. Okay. Um, so I mean, this one assumes that we've already got a model here, right? So you can just like retrieve it from the MLflow tracking server based on the the run identifier. Or you can pull it out of Unity Catalog if you know, you know, the catalog schema and model name. Um, but yeah, it, you probably be familiar with this pattern of using the particular flavors load model method in order to pull that model back in yeah. its original form. Um, but there's kind of there's a second option which is using the PyFunk flavor, uh, and so within PyFunk there's this method called Spark UDF. And so what this can do is bring back your, your model as something that's already wrapped in a way that Spark can um, parallelize the process of, of scoring new observations as individual Spark tasks. Um, and so this gives you back something which is a, a, a PySpark UDF. And let's say I, I bring some new data in here and I want to run this on my new distributed Spark data frame. Um, yeah. That's pretty easy. I can just call it as a normal function within um, Within the width column method of the the PySpark API, and then it needs to pass in uh, which columns it's going to use for for scoring, yep. um, and then that will just run the model over my my data and give back predictions. Cool. I mean, you've got your time taken there is four. If you scroll on ever so slightly, Stuart, was it four to six point two seconds? Or yes. that's how do you? I don't, have know, I don't know how many records there are in this in this data set, but yeah, or or how expensive this model is. But yeah. Presumably it's, a, it's a big data set for it to take that long. But I was just one question I had around this is have you got a feel in terms of comparison? If you were if you didn't use Spark to parallelize the inference uh, compared to what you've done here, do you have a feel in terms of the time difference? Um, so obviously you're 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 locked to doing everything in a single thread because yep. of the way, the way Python works, yep. uh, which is fine. Um, there it, so if you're able to turn this into, well, I don't know how many, uh, how many tasks it's generated when, when it was executed, but let's say it was on a cluster that had 64 cores 
So you should be able to split your data set into 64 discrete uh, partitions yeah. and then run, run this model on each one. So all else being equal, it should take one sixty-fourth of the time. Yeah, that so that's, of course, isn't quite the case because yeah. Spark has to do a bunch of stuff with scheduling and optimization yeah. in order to, to make it possible to parallelize that process. Yeah. Um, but it will be in, in that kind of order. Yeah, but that's just significantly quicker, right? Even yes. if it's like one sixty-fourth, and that that just it, yeah, it's, it'll be a lot lot faster. Yes, and and, and the, the kind of the other interesting aspect of this pattern is that this will accept any kind of Spark data frame, so that includes streaming data frames. If you want to deploy your model directly into a a streaming pipeline, yep, that's easy. You just use this exact method. Um, we've got an example in the article which shows like how to use that using Delta Live tables. So that's something which can fit in really nicely with the probably the way your data engineers like to work as well. Take a model that, that you've trained in this kind of inner loop of the MLOps world, yeah, uh, and put that straight into the the outer loop, the the kind of the deploy and manage part of the uh, of the process. Mm -hmm. How does this fit into the world of MLOps then? The the first part I would say is uh, it makes. The difference between what you are building in development and what you deploy into production much smaller, right? Because uh, typically, when things get put into production, they'll be built using the tools that data engineers like using. Um, so, if it's using Spark, it's much more likely that they'll, or much less likely that they'll have to rework what you've done in your, you know, in your Python-based notebook uh, in order to make it something that they can manage, observe, schedule, and and run as a Spark job. Um, that would be the, the main difference, I think. And I guess another way of thinking about it is that MLOps is about how you build, evaluate, and deploy your exactly. machine learning applications, right? And Spark helps you build these applications in a better way, an easier way if you have big data or big computational problems. Otherwise, you can go ahead and try to implement a distribution mechanism yourself, but yep. that would be very, very complicated. Yeah, yep, I agree. So I've got another question. How, how, in your opinion, how would you compare Spark to Ray in terms of parallelization? That's a great question. So Spark and Ray, they're both uh, tools to distribute your your tasks, right? Your the job that you want to run. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but each of them also have their own specific uh, strength. Uh, you can actually you can combine the use of uh, Ray and Spark. Uh, if you want to use Ray on Databricks, um, you can do so. So we have an integration. Uh, it's, we are actively developing that. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say it depends on the task. So I cannot give a um, one uh, one answer for every every question. Every yeah, perfect. Yeah, I agree. Yep. Brilliant. I think this brings us to the to the end of, of the session of the YouTube uh, recording. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Stuart and Sabi, for joining us again today. Um, if you like content like this, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you want to see anything else on Databricks or how we do MLOps on Databricks, please add to the comments below as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Gabby.